Hey, Brother Roy here, Old School Bible Baptist Ministries. We're going to talk today about the Fundy Talmud. Let's pray first. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for grace. Thank you for liberty. Thank you for the new covenant. Hallelujah. Um, God, just, uh, uh, just be with me in these next few moments and help me to convey some real truth um, some balance uh, to this subject in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. So I, I make a play on words with, the, I say, the Fundy Talmud uh, because of something called the Babylonian Talmud. Amen. Um, so let's, uh, let's take, a, take a quick look at that. Uh, the Babylonian Talmud is uh, 613 commandments that the Jews added to the Hebrew Old Testament. Um, this is, uh, uh, was compiled by scholars in Babylon. You'll remember that the Jews were taken into captivity in Babylon. And in Babylon, they lived, they, they built houses, they built schools and synagogues, centers of learning. And so Babylon, whereas Jerusalem was the heart of Judaism, Babylon was really the brains of Judaism. It was the scholastic Jews, and it was there that uh, that we get the Babylonian Talmud. So, if we look here, the Talmud actually consists of two works: the Mishnah, the Oral Torah, which, according to the tradition, was given to Moses at Mount Sinai, alongside the written Torah, the Mishnah was written down for the first time by Rabbi Yehuda uh, Hanisi, uh, Rabbi Judah the Prince, following the destruction of the Second Temple uh, in 70 AD. However, while Rabbi Yehuda started the process of writing down the Mishnah, the work was completed by his sons and also includes and references the commentaries of earlier rabbis. The collection of rabbis whose works went into the, the Mishnah are referred to as the Tanaim. And the Tanaim lived from about 30 BC to 200 AD. So what we have here is the 613 added rules, regulations that Jesus referred to as to the Jews as your traditions, the traditions of men that were added to the word of God. Amen. So, and we can see that over here in Mark chapter seven. I'll read a little bit of that for you. You can get the context. Um, Mark chapter seven and verse one, then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes, which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say, with unwashing hands, they found fault. Remember that. They found fault. They were looking for fault. They were making up fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not, holding the traditions of the elders. And when they came from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things, okay? and many other things there be which they have received to hold as the washing of cups and pots and brazen vessels and of tables. And when the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashing hands? He answered and he said unto them, Well has Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites. As it is written, this people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me. Here it is. Don't miss it. Teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such things as ye do. And he said unto them, Full well you reject the commandments of God that you may keep your own tradition. 
See, this is what this these tradition. This was the the Babylonian Talmud. These were the, all the 613 laws and rules and regulations about every little area of life. I, I mean, how, how you did this and how you did that and how you went to the bathroom and how you washed your cup and your eh, 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 eh. see and 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 Jesus wasn't with that at all. He was not with that at all. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 23. Verses 1 through 6. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and the greetings in the markets to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. See? be seen of men. They lay heavy burdens. See, this is the Babylonian Talmud. All right? Well, hey, we got in our circles, listen, I'm an independent Bible-believing Baptist. Amen? I am an independent Bible-believing Baptist, and I hold strongly to all the fundamentals of the faith. But we have seen in our circles, in our churches, a trend towards legalism and outward religiosity and an adding, an adding of many rules and regulations, and we call them standards of convictions, uh, at, that are being heavy burdens put on people this is the way we do it but it's not biblical it's not biblical i'll just give you a, a i'll break a couple of them down real quick from the scripture and then i'll just list some more uh just to name them because there's not gonna go for an hour here but let me just give you a couple Real quick, this is a big one. This is the real big one. You run into this all the time. This has this has pastors that will fellowship with each other and arguing and church splits and everything, and that's <laughs> divorce and remarriage, marriage, divorce and remarriage, marriage, divorce and remarriage. All right. Let me read. Let me read it to you from the Fundy Talmud. All right, from the Fundy Talmud. We go to 1 Timothy 3 2. Hey, I know it's going to upset some folks. Hey, but look, you need to be upset. If this is as far as you went in your study on the subject, you read one verse without any context and took your own private interpretation of the verse and you're running with that and you're trying to impose that on everybody else. Well, you need to be upset because you need to, you need to get right on the thing. Amen. Look, first Timothy chapter three, verse one. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop or pastor, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. You know anybody blameless? I don't. The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, etc. But he has to be the husband of one wife. The Fundy Talmud says that's one wife ever. Okay. That's the way you read it. And without any context, okay, maybe you could read that. Uh, does that count? If 
your wife died, and if you get married again, that would be two wives. So is that not good? Or uh, if somebody was divorced from their wife, that's no longer their wife, and they remarry, it, that, now they have two wives, or does the divorce, was, you see what I'm saying? Without some context, there's many ways you can interpret that. Uh, as, and especially in light of history and culture and the rest of the Bible where polygamy was a big thing. Uh, a bit, polygamy was big even in the patriarchs that are of the nation of Israel. So that's, of course, that's in the context here. So he's saying the husband of one wife, you're not supposed to be like David or Solomon or Abraham, or you're not supposed to have multiple wives. You need to be the husband of one wife if you're a pastor in this church. All right? That's another interpret. So use a whole bunch of different ways you could interpret that. But if that's all you do is read that and take jump knee-jerk reaction to the very first thing, well, there it says it right there, husband of one wife. If you've ever been divorced and remarried, now you got two wives. You can't be a pastor. That's the way they read it. That's the way it's written in the Fundy Talmud. That's not the way it's written in the King James Bible. What they've done is laid a heavy burden and they have ignored the word of God for the traditions of men. All right? Put some context on that thing. That's not, that's not the only thing Paul said on the subject in the New Testament, in case you haven't run the cross-references and studied the whole thing out. Amen? Look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Yeah. Is divorce, is divorce sin? Well, sure it is. But see, that's what Jesus was talking about. God, God knew the hardness of your heart. He made that allowance, right? It's sin. Amen. But go on. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, look at verse 15. Cold context here is the marriage. Oh, back it up to verse 10. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. Uh, 11, but, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. Let not the husband put away, from, put away uh, his wife. Amen. All right. So, yeah, that, no, you're supposed to stay together. Divorce is a sin. But you go, go down here to verse 15. But if the unbelieving depart, let them depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God has called us to peace. Okay. So, if one leaves, the brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. Well, what's he talking about? Well, he tells us a little bit more. But then, like verse 27, 28. Are there, art thou bound to a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Don't, don't get a divorce. Divorce is wrong, right? Art thou loosed from a wife? <laughs> hey, did it happen anyway? Hey, seek not a wife. But if, if you did get loosed from a wife, seek not a wife, but, but if you went and did, Look at verse 28. But, and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. Okay? So, it is, divorce is not God's perfect will. So, divorce is sin. But once it happens, what happens to the, with the believer? Well, 1 John. Chapter 1 and verse 9. So if you do get a divorce, huh? how come the believer is no longer under bondage? Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness except divorce and remarriage. <laughs> no, <laughs> to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Look, fun, Fundy Talmud, Fundy Talmud is going to try to put a restriction on the cleansing power of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
I'm here to tell you today that when you get your sin under the blood, God doesn't see it. It's cast as far as the east is from the west. And in the eyes of God, it's just as if it never happened. And that's the power of the blood of Jesus. And you can't take a narrow interpretation of First Timothy and somehow try to trump the blood of Jesus with that. That's not the Bible. That's the Fundy Talmud. That is the traditions of men. There, the, divorce and remarriage is not the unpardonable sin that the blood of Jesus doesn't cover. Amen? So that's, that's just one big one right there where they have just made a whole doctrine around one verse and ignored what the Word of God says throughout the rest of the Word of God and basically limiting the cleansing power of the blood of Christ. So that's that one. How about another one? All right. Here's something that we run into out here where I live. I live in Las Vegas. It gets up uh, 120 degrees in the summer. And there are some fundy Talmudists <laughs> who says nobody should ever wear shorts. Nobody ever. I'm talking about men. I'm talking about women. No one should ever wear a pair of shorts and be right with God. Amen. Is that in your Bible? What do you think? Huh? Is that just traditions of man that they made up? Legalistic rules? Or is that in the Bible? Well, let's see what the Bible says. Amen. <laughs> All right. So look at Let's let's see what uh, 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 Isaiah says, 47 and 3. Isaiah, 47 and 3. All right, here's what Isaiah says. Uh... Thy nakedness shall be uncovered, yea, thy shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance and will not meet thee as a man. And that is the wrong reference I got there. The one I was looking for was the, um, the, the, uh, the naked, the uh, uncovered thigh is nakedness and shame. But uh, that's fine. Go to Exodus 28 because I have two, I got two verses on it. So we can do the same thing with ex Exodus chapter 28. Exodus 28 and 42. It will define what is the nakedness and the shame. This is for the priestly garments. And thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness. All right. So what is nakedness then? From the loins even unto the thighs they shall reach. Okay, so God told you right there to, that there, the nakedness is the loins, that's the waist, down to the thighs, that, that's, that's to right above the knee. So that's naked, all right? Waist to right above the knee, that's nakedness according to the Word of God. And then you've got, of course, the verse which says, uh, man shall not what wear that which pertaineth to a woman, or a woman that which pertaineth to a man. But you have to understand, when that was written, men were wearing robes, which is by any other name, a dress. Amen? <laughs> Everybody wore the dress. They wore robes. Uh, the whole concept of, uh, uh, of pants uh, uh, and breeches uh, came in much later, and the separation of uh, 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 being for men or being for women, uh, that, that was more of a European thing that came in. It was cultural. It was a matter of choice. It was a matter of style and stuff. Listen, the, 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 what God is saying is be modest. Be modest. Don't show your, your bare legs, your thighs from the, from the, from the thighs, the waist down to the knee. That's the naked part. All right. So if it's a pair of loose, modest shorts, 
it's actually more modest than a pair of culottes because the culottes in the right situation and angle you could see up you could see up under but a pair of shorts that's more modest you're more covered a lady's more covered in a pair of shorts than she is in a pair of culottes as long as the shorts are loose and they come down to the knee there there is nothing in the bible telling you that a woman cannot wear it or a man wear a pair of loose shorts that come down to the knee that is completely modest and completely appropriate for desert and tropical climates so there's this another one where somebody has taken a narrow interpretation and tried to make a rule out of it try to make a law a burden to put on believers listen we are too dressed modestly but i mean do you want to wear a, a have everybody wear a hajib like the muslims do with just a little eye slot and walk around i mean there's some balance to this thing and what about what we have to wear to church listen if you know me you know i love i love putting on a suit and a tie i mean hey after 30 years in present prison man it's a blessing to be able to dress up man i man i i i 90 percent 95 percent of the time when i preach i am wearing a suit and a tie that's just to me that just feels like a preacher's uniform i'm going to work i just feel like like I'm an ambassador for Christ, and uh, man, I'm going to dress my best, but that's me. See, there are a lot of people in a lot of churches, in rural communities, farm communities, uh, mountain communities, of uh, 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 foreign mission fields. Nobody wears a suit and tie. That's not part of anything anybody owns. How you can't put, you don't, you don't, men, every man come to church, you must wear a suit and tie. Boy, if you're on that, you're stuck on that, here's what you should do. You should take a look at your services and a Jehovah Witness service or a Mormon service and just turn the volume off and watch them. I bet you can't tell the difference. Because everybody, everybody got their little suit and tie. Everybody got their same little haircut. Listen, God did not call us to that. You got people coming in fresh from the world, fresh from sin, the visitors coming to church, and it, it, you're going to enforce a, a dress standard of suit and tie on them? Look, somebody grows in their faith and has a calling as a minister and starts feeling the move of God and God touches their heart, like me. Man, I, I'll put on my suit and tie every time I get a chance, but I'm certainly not going to impose that which God has moved on my heart about in that matter and put it on somebody else or make it a rule in the church. It's just wrong. It's just wrong. It's not in the Bible. It's something that man has made up and added to the Bible, just like the 613 rules that the Babylonian Talmud added to the Jewish Old Testament. And Jesus said, you've traded the commandments of God for your own traditions, what to be seen of men. Oh, look how sharp our bunch is here. We all have a suit and tie on. That's hey, I can see that in a preacher meeting, but not in not in a hospital. That's what your church is supposed to be. It's a hospital calling the wounded in, calling the sinner in, calling the broken in. And listen, you come as you are. You come as you are. Amen. So that's what I say on that one. And uh, now there's, how about, how about the sinner's prayer thing, right? And there's two extremes to that. Look, at if you didn't come down and uh, to the altar and repeat this prayer and say it just the way we said and believe just what we told you, you didn't get saved. That's not in the Bible. The <laughs> Bible talks about trusting and receiving the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> it doesn't say, there's no way there you have to say a prayer. But then we stop the people that are against the sinner's prayer. There's no way in there that says you can't say a sinner's prayer. 
There's nothing wrong with saying the sinner's prayer. And there's not, nothing wrong with sitting in your seat and, and opening your heart, trusting and believing and getting saved silently with the, the calling, huh? At a the call on God out of a pure heart in your seat without ever moving your mouth, you could get saved. Look, there's people get saved all kinds. Be getting saved is receiving the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting and believing on him. And he comes inside of you in the person of his Holy Spirit and you're born again. That's being saved. You ain't got to come down and, 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 and recite this certain prayer or something. Again, Fundy Talmud, Fundy Talmud, traditions of men over what the Bible says. Um, drums. Oh, you can't have drums in your church. What? The, the Bible is packed full of percussive symbols and, and, and tablets and percussive instruments in the worship and praise of God. So, so hey, you don't want them in your church? You don't like them? Okay, that's fine. But you can't say, oh, they're of the devil. That's not a guy. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible talks about lifting your hands. The Bible talks about clapping your hands. Huh? They're like church. You can't lift your hands. You can't clap your hands. Bible says, lift your hands unto God. Shout unto God with a voice of cry. Clap your hands, all you people. Shout. I mean, that's this in the Bible. But no, that's against the rule in our church. See? Fundy Talmud. Pharisaical stuff. Putting on people the traditions of men. And, and, and look, that turns people off. Because you know what? It's not, it's not Holy Spirit, and it's not Bible. It's religion. <laughs> That's what it is. Just like the Mormons do. Just like the Jehovah Witnesses do. Look, we shouldn't be trying to be like them. Uh, we ha there is liberty in Christ. Uh, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, hallelujah, there's liberty. Amen. Amen. So you've got the same thing with the perfect haircuts. How long is long? Look, a man shouldn't have a hair all down here where it's in his way and stuff. But, I mean, if it's a little bit over his ears, is that long? Uh, is this long? I mean, come on. You can't, you can't, you don't get to make the rules up. You don't get to make up those rules in your fundy town mud. You, got, you have to let the Holy Spirit have some liberty to teach people in their own heart and guide and lead them because everybody ain't the same. There is diversity in the body of Christ. And here's another one. Just being horrible to women. Look, I understand all the verses. Let, let not a, a woman teach. Let not a woman usurp authority. But check out your context over there. The word in the church, in the church, the church, the church, the church is just splattered throughout those chapters. The context of all of that is in the church, in the church, in the church. We are talking about a woman usurping authority in the church, having the, the, the preaching position in a church. No, Paul expressly forbids that. But on the contrary, in a woman's personal life and her space, in her exposure and in her world, she is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ everywhere she goes, to everyone she knows, at her work, on her Facebook, and on her YouTube, from the street corner if she wants. The Bible doesn't say not to do that. The Bible tells all believers to go ye out into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Sharing your faith and talking about Jesus isn't usurping authority over anyone. And it's certainly not in the church if it's in your life and your personal space somewhere. So, like I said, again, narrow, personal, private interpretation where we make up a rule that's not in the Bible. And uh, let me see. I, hey, I, I covered that. I covered that. I covered that. I covered that. You get the idea. We should not be stuffy, legalistic, and pharisaical. We need to let people have the liberty that they have in Christ Jesus. I'm not talking about dressing immodestly. I'm not talking about bringing in any new music or light shows or anything like that. I'm just talking about not making up a bunch of rules 
that aren't in the Bible and trying to put those on our people. Because that, that, does, that does the work of Christ a disservice. So, hey, throw out your fundy Talmud and your man-made rules and watch God bless your ministry more and more. Amen? Go buy the book, but don't add to the book. Amen? God bless you. We'll see you in the next one.